Hey, let's work baseball. He says, let's play ball. The Texas pitching continues to be brilliant. Everything that you love about baseball as a child, he polishes and says, let me make this even more enjoyable for you. Let me make it more fun. Let me make it more perfect for you. He's a romantic guy in the sense that he loves the game. He loves the poetry of it. And he understands the viciousness of how the baseball gods can treat you, how cruel they can be. I believe he's not just the best college baseball coach in America, but the best coach in America, period, in all sports. And he's been proven for 30 years uh, winning national championships at two different schools. This one's hit in the air to deep left center. Anybody that's won a national championship in four different decades, what an amazing statistic. When we take a look around at all the coaches, we all love him. He's beat more of us than anybody else in NCAA baseball history, and we love him. He's like the guy you take to the poker game, and at, and at the end of the night, he's got to, your car keys, and you ask him to come back next week to take the deed to your house. I mean, he, he, he buries all of it, and then we all just still love him. And, and that's what I think really separates him, is he can stick it to you, and you still love him. He makes you smile. Hog is a lot of fun to be around. that nobody else can match. He won three national championships at Cal State Fullerton. Then he moved on to skipper the Texas Longhorns in Austin, where he has since added two more titles, giving him five national championships in all now, and the distinction as the only man to win championships at two different schools, and the winningest coach of all time. This is your fifth national championship, your second with the Longhorns. What memory do you take from this, Augie? Uh, we're looking for a shortstop for next year. That's your memory? <laughs> it's my recruiting speech. <laughs> Any great coach, whether it's uh, John Wooden, Mike Krzyzewski, Don Shula, uh, they have to be a fundamental coach. It's, their teams have to play well fundamentally. And Guido's teams are great fundamentally. They could always bunt. They could always hit the cutoff man. They could always steal at the right time. They didn't miss signals. So fundamentally, they were good. A lot of guys could teach fundamentals. But you had to have that. Above that, Guido was a cool guy who had a lot of charisma. He's the kind of guy that everybody either hated or loved because he was the best looking guy in the room. He was the best dressed guy in the room. He had the best stories to tell. And he had the best looking women. And all the players liked that. He was just a cool guy. And so he transcended baseball. He became a, an icon to look up to as, for young men. And uh, Augie also had the unique ability to get his teams to win uh, in multiple ways. He could get them by commanding it, demanding that they play well. He could cajole them out of it. He could almost whine and whimper and say, please, and plead with them to get it out. He can be very calm and cool about her. He can be angry. He can use all the psychological tools to get his team to play at its maximum. This is serious business. Let me put it in this perspective. How many guys in Iraq have died your age? Ask yourself that question. Now are you doing your best? Are you doing your best with your attitude? Are you doing your best with all your efforts? Think about that. There's no way you're going to show up and play for Augie Garrido without being prepared. Not acceptable. Ready, go.
getting his hip through better. If you ever had the opportunity to sit through one of his practices beginning to end, you will see that there's not one minute that everybody on that field don't have something they're supposed to be doing, and they better be doing. I learned more from football coaches about how to organize practice, because when I was coming up, there weren't a lot of baseball coaches that had baseball into the right practice form. Now, most coaches do. And then I kind of stole from basketball uh, rhythm and tempo and timing, because it is a game of, you know, gets down to that. It's so much speed and everything involved. You've got to know what pitch you want to get him out with. It's like playing pool. You got to set it up from there. You got to you got to use one shot to make the next shot. So if you miss, and, and let's say you go high and you and, and you miss with a fastball high, what's he looking for? Breaking ball away. And they, so you go with the and if you want to go inside the strike zone, you go down. And it doesn't have to be down and one pitch on the inside corner. Just down in the middle, not away. Unless the umpire is giving you away. The great coaches allow their players to see who they are. They don't give them coaching jargon. They don't give them things out of a book. They don't give them X's and O's. They give them themselves. If you don't trust yourself, you listen to everyone around, and it gives you an excuse to blame them. You're not going to learn things that way. That isn't who you are. That isn't who you want to be. You want to be the leader. And in your, and in your, so to keep it simple, it takes courage to be truthful with yourself. And it takes courage to take the responsibility to trust yourself. It gets them running for the game of life, not just baseball, to further your career in baseball, but for the game of life. And, um, you know, there's going to be lots of ups and downs for these kids. Uh, which Augie knows, his coaching staff knows. He's got a great coaching staff, surrounds himself with great, great people, and that's what they do. They teach. Let your body find its own way through the process. You've got to find a normal response and a normal reaction for it to finally belong to you. You're trying to manufacture it through your mind. Just take it out of your glove and throw it. There. The coach who will excel and be remembered is this way, the guy who direction. realizes that a coach will be remembered not for what he knows, but for what his players have learned. And I think Augie exemplifies that as well as anyone. This looks so easy when we put it on the blackboard. It's glove and come down here for a minute. It's an easy trap to fall into, but I, I want to make you aware that you need to keep your focus on the ball and let the ball tell you what to do, like you did on the first two pitches. But then when you got the two balls and one strike, I think that was the count. Where did you swing? Two and one or two and one? You anticipated strike. And so you swung at a ball. The other one is three and two, you anticipated strike. Work to keep the count out of your evaluation of whether you should swing or not. From my point of view, I'm trying to help each individual in their performance. So it's about understanding what moments belong to you and how you perform with the ball, away from the ball, anticipating the ball. Uh, what is your performance? Have one, Dre. Nice. I think he makes everybody feel real comfortable. He's one of those that he always says, I just stay out of their way. He always tries to do that. But he does. I mean, he points you in the right direction and makes you find stuff on your own. The coach's role ends up being far different than what many people think it is. It's about providing and organizing the information to help the player succeed. But only the player can succeed. And it belongs to the player when he does. But baseball is going to ensure that that player fails and fails a lot. And now the coach becomes in support of those failures. And I like to think that we encourage those failures because we want them taking risks. We want them finding out more about themselves. I think that's the value of baseball. You look in the paper at the end of the major league season and there's 10, 12 hitters at the most hitting over 300. And all these players, so you go, wow, these pitchers must have really done great. And there's 10 pitchers that did well. 
baseball screws everybody. <laughs> it, it, it takes no sides. Everyone fails. It's a game of failure. Do your best. You're going to fail, so do your best again. He says that all the time, and that's the truth. Baseball in and of itself, to me, is very cruel, and I talk about that all the time, because it hurts the people I care about. I care about the players. I care about their parents. I care about their grandparents, and it hurts them. It hurts them a lot, and it hurts them often. So I see it as pretty cruel. All you got to do is just start thinking you've got it figured out and start thinking that you're pretty good, and it will just smoke you. <laughs> Baseball's a game that's going to come, it's going to go. In my coaching career, I've coached for 37 years, so we've won five national championships, but we've lost 32 times. That's a lot. And so uh, in those 32 times, we've produced a lot of major league players. But less than 1% of the players I've coached during that period of time have made a living playing baseball where they didn't have to go out and do something else. All of you, this is a rough game. It is not kind, and it is not easy. And every day in this clubhouse, when things are over with, some guys are going to feel pretty good about their offensive performance, and some guys are going to feel pretty about it. And some guys are going to feel pretty good about their pitching performance, and some guys are going to feel pretty lousy about it. But we can't let the negative things start to bring everybody down. We are finally only as strong as our weakest link. That's what the rallies are about. That's what teamwork is about. Uh, we had an incident today. We're going to have to deal with it. What did it reveal? A hell of a third baseman! <laughs> All right. So we'll just keep moving forward. But don't let these things... You, you can if you choose, okay? If you let the negative things overwhelm you and overpower you, you will be miserable. That's all there is to it because that's the kind of game it is. If you get it behind you, if it bothers you for a while, you got to think it through, nothing wrong with that. you got to work some things out in your own head, nothing wrong with that. But when you show up tomorrow, it's a new day, and you need to see the opportunity. I think there's a way to put ourselves in a no-fail environment. It becomes an education process. I think that when you're successful as a player, you need to reward yourself. Anybody can do this when it's going good. The champions overcome when it's going really bad. And then you, you need to remember the things that went into that and hold on to your performances. But when you are doing your best and you fail, you need to look at that to find out what message is, is in that for me. I've done everything I know how to do. I'm trying my best. What else do I need to learn? And now, if you're looking at it that way, it isn't a failure. It's an experience. And it's an opportunity to learn. And that's the way I want it to be for our players. A simple formula. Eliminate the fear. It's fun. Stay with the process. Eliminate the reward. It's fun. You want to have fun playing baseball? Play it for the right reasons. Your growth, your development, your performances. He goes, if I were to get in a fight, sword fight, that, that darn fencing guy up there, whatever is teaching him, what are they, you get one of them swords, what are they, a foils? He goes, if I were to get in a fight with him, if I challenged him to a duel, if I walked up and I slapped him and I challenged him to a duel, and I never picked up a dang sword in my life, and he comes down, and this guy's a national champion, and he comes down, and we go toe to toe, he goes, I'll win. And we're all looking at each other like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, come on. He says, you know why I'll win? He says, because I'll take out a gun and I'll shoot the son of a And uh, I didn't know whether to laugh Obviously, it was a very intense situation, but it just cracked. But I think everybody wanted to laugh, but nobody did because we didn't want to run like we did the night before. But, but the point was, you need to find a way to win. And, and I'm always going to find a way to win. I'm going to figure it out one way or the other. 
And the, and the funny thing is, I think back on it is, I don't think Indiana Jones had come out yet. First of all, you can't teach competitiveness. Either you compete at stuff that you do or you don't. He hates to lose, you know? Like we all do, he hates it with a passion. 0 oh 2, 0 oh 2, 1-2, 1-2, 0-2, and we're losing the game! But he understands that losing is part of it. He teaches you that losing is part of it. But he also teaches you that losing is part of learning. Get to here and do this. He lets you know, hey, you got your beat today. You know why? Because that guy wanted it more than you did. He absolutely, he kicked your teeth in. He challenges your existence. He challenges your, you as a person. And it's a healthy thing. And if you realize that he's doing it out of love for you, he's doing it because he wants you to get it. He wants you to realize this is what's best for you. And, and so if it takes a challenge to get it out of you, then he'll challenge you. I love baseball. You know why? They don't have one guy on that team could play for us. And they kicked the ever-loving out of us. The score does not even reveal the difference in these two teams. If this was a fist fight or a gang fight, which most of you don't know one thing about, we would be dead. If it was a boxing match and each individual took the beating that we took here today, I wouldn't have to be doing this. I'd just come and visit your in the hospital and say, when you get your wires off of your mouth from the broken jaw and you can see again because your eyes are swollen now and you can walk again because a guy just punched you in the gut 55 times, all I'd have to say is, when all that, when you get better, we'll have a little chat about how this guy just destroyed you, okay? Now, I'm not depersonalizing this when I say you. Us is the right word. It applies to all of us. I'm taking the blame, so don't, I don't want this to sound like, I, they, they outcoached us because they played better. I'll take the blame for the loss, but I want you to see clearly crystal clear about what this game is really about. Just do whatever it takes. There's no excuses in competitive athletics. Get it done. Do whatever it takes. Once the game starts, you can win the game. But do whatever it takes. No excuses. The result is, if you've done your best and you have accepted your challenges that the game presents to you and you walk away the loser, then tip your hat to your opponent and find out maybe, maybe you lost the game in January when you didn't show up to practice. Maybe you lost the game because, you know, there's, there's, there's an idea out there that the war is won before the first battle is ever fought. And I believe that. I grew up in a federal housing project. Uh, it was a part of the Second World War, federally funded, so no one traveled, no one did anything. And, and so you, you became a part of your neighborhood and, and a part of your environment. And that's as big as the world uh, would get, except when I went to the movies. My dad was one of eight children. His family migrated from Spain, and they actually went by ship from uh, Spain into Hawaii. And then they cut sugarcane, picked pineapples, and worked as migrant workers to pay for their passage. Where they landed was San Francisco. My mother was one of 11. She went to the third grade, and that was all that she had in the way of formal education. They left Texas, a little sharecropper's ranch outside of Lubbock. And my mom and dad actually met in the Napa Valley picking fruit. 
We started right here in the second grade. When I first met Augie, there's a little spot on the small side where the little kids were, and Augie was taken on all comers in wrestling. Augie was a, a little bit smarter than the rest of us, because we played hopscotch. We would find a rock for a lagger. Augie always had a little chain in his pocket. He never lost at hopscotch. Once in a while, we had a chain, but we'd forget it. Augie never forgot his chain. They didn't have Little League then, they had a peanut league. And uh, I guess around 12 years old, you'd try out for a team. And there was, you know, about 16, 17 guys, and we were the mutts. So in order for us to uh, get playing time, we had to hustle. The living environment was tough. It was competitive. My father was hard on Augie, very difficult. My father was competitive to begin with. He had that athletic, competitive edge to him. His passion for sports uh, carried over to when he went to work on the shipyard. He had a job for the federal government on the Mare Island Naval Shipyard. There was a community building. It was run by the Recreation Department for the Federal Housing Project. It had all the facilities. And he was the nighttime director. He'd work on the shipyard during the day, come home, we'd eat dinner at 5 o'clock every night, and we'd be at the community building, which is three blocks away at 6 o'clock. He was the catcher, and he was the coach, and he was the captain, and I was the bat boy. And that's kind of where all the sports came in. And I basically have him to thank. Our father wanted him to be the best that Augie could be, but I don't think he really handled it in the proper way. In a sense, it worked for Augie because it made him have more drive and more, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna prove to you, I'm going to, I'm gonna do it no matter what you say, because my father had also a lot of fear in him. He had the fire all the time, always had the fire to win, to win, and then to win, sometimes you're playing somebody just as good or a little bit better, so you have to figure out how to beat them. And he had that. One of the things I was good at was uh, spinning a yo-yo. And I won a lot of blue ribbons at the community building at about 11 years old, spinning a yo-yo. I could do all those tricks, you know. When I went to my dad, I said, uh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to college. And that meant going away from home. He said, no, you're going to work on the shipyard. I already have a job for you on the shipyard. I said, no, I'm going to be a coach. He said, you can't get a job being a coach. And I said, no. I said, I know something. I saw a guy on Ed Sullivan. He was on national television spinning a yo-yo. He got paid for it, and he was having fun doing it. And I could have beat him. So I'm going to college, I'm going to be a coach, because I know that if you're the best at whatever you do, you can make a living at it. And I think it made things very clear for Augie of what he was going to do and what he wasn't going to do. And what he wasn't going to do is work on Mare Island. And what he was going to do was be a coach and prove my father wrong. And when Augie became the number one winningest coach in the nation, what he did was he looked up and he said, I told you so. Baseball players and athletes are performers. And for them to ensure their success, they have to find their joy in trying to master their performance. And they have to do it with the fundamentals of the game, the skill sets and the mental sets of what goes into their performance. And when they find the fun and the joy in that process, rather than playing for the reward, that's when their brilliance comes out. You think it's about winning for him because he's won so much and he's always said to the players focus on pitch by pitch and and doing the basics and the winning takes care of itself scoreboard is not a factor it's the inning that counts it's the effort that counts it's the aggressiveness that counts <laughs> He is more concerned with maximizing whatever it is that you are and whatever it is that, that, you, that you're doing and, and trying to pull that out of someone. And I'm gonna tell you on a personal level, I'm with you guys. I care a lot about you and I really am with you. 
But when I see you wasting your talent and joking with yourself and kidding yourself, not joking Lee, but thinking you're making the best effort when you're not, that bothers me. I can live with the airs. I can live with the strikeouts. I can live with all the But when I see you cheating yourself, I'm going to tell you what gets to me. It's my own problem, my own insecurities. You may have a lot of things in your life, okay? I don't. I have you, and I have this baseball team. And when we play, when we go out on the field and we don't do our best, I risk my life with you every time we walk on this field. Understand? This is real personal. Real personal. I understand that. I don't go here very often, but I'm dead serious. I can take it if you can take it, okay? But I can't take it when you're not doing your best. And there's a hell of a lot of difference between what happened in the second part of that game. You got past the point of trying. You got past the point of worrying. You got past the point of anything. You got out there and you competed. You competed your off. You did a great job. You didn't talk about how many pitches, how many innings, how many anything. You went after it. That's what I'm talking about. The effort made by the players on the field was a championship effort. Okay, if we lose, f*** it. But when we take our eye off the ball at second base, trying to go to second, when all we have to do is go to first, that bothers me a lot. And if I just keep it inside over and over, how'd we bunt today? Not worth did we? Why? Concentration. Concentration. Commitment. Willpower. That's what I'm pissed off about. I am sitting here watching a team play at exactly the same level of those guys. You know who they are? Nine guys named Joe that you can find anywhere. Really? Really? You know who you are? You are the best baseball team in America. If you can stick to the fundamentals and build a fire in your to, to, to get competitive on an inning by any basis where no one is ever going to take anything away from you. But we are not going to get something for nothing. We have got to pay the price that baseball demands. It demands everything. Courage, it, it, it demands intelligence, it demands toughness. This is important. Not because of the fans, but because of what it does for you as you mature and you grow, you start to get mentally tougher so that anything you want to do in your entire life, you'll be able to outcompete anyone around you. You know how to pay the price. You have a work ethic. You have a focus. You have the ability to be intense. You have the ability to, to, to have the courage to make the decisions to act on your thoughts, which is what life finally ends up all about, being all about. Having the courage to act on your own ideas and become who you want to become. What a privilege that is. my song on you. I shot the sheriff. We're going to figure out how to get that breaking ball in the dirt, boy. Nice going. Great job. Awesome. He was a team player and a leader and an exciting, very exciting player and could play a lot of positions. I think he played second place. He played shortstop. He played the outfield. He played first base. He was a real versatile guy. He was colorful. Uh, he had charisma. Uh, he had great personality as a player. He was a fan favorite because he would make things happen. He was a great student of the game. He was well coached. He would make the right uh, throw from the outfield, get in the right position, hit the cutoff man, and he could bunt. He didn't hit for home run power, but he was uh, a lot of singles, doubles, and triples. You know, he hit 383 for a career, which is second best st still in this school history. He hit 430 one year his last year, which is second best in the school history. And that was an exciting time. Fresno State uh, really had some colorful, good ball clubs. They'd gone to the College World Series in 59 for the very first time. 
<laughs> I tell you, I, I can't really say the stuff that Algy and I did, but we had a great time together, uh, socially too now. It wasn't all here on the baseball field. I mean, we traveled together and we socialized together and we double dated with gals and it was all fun. He was good at that too. <laughs> he was pretty good at that too, I can tell you that. I think Augie would say to you first and foremost that Pete Biden is the reason that he has become such a successful coach. And that is a big part of it. Pete Biden was a unique animal, a unique person. He is one of the finest fundamentalists in the history of baseball anywhere. He really knew baseball inside and out. He learned it and he taught it to all of us that played for him. All you'd have to do is say, Pete, uh, when are you doing an inside pitch with a right-handed batter? You got a 30-minute lecture on catching. If you said, what about the spin on the curveball, he'd give you a lecture on pitching. And I think Augie just was like a sponge around Pete and picked all that stuff up and then took it a little bit further with his personality and with his tenaciousness. Now, Pete Biden was not a uh, hugging kind of guy. He was pretty gruff, but uh, you knew he was gruff because he wanted you to be a better baseball player and he wanted you to be a better guy in life. Pete always let the players elect the captain and I was winning. And he went, oh no, not this guy. <laughs> and so that's kind of how that all went during that period of time. And later on, um, uh, I said to him, I said, you know, coach, I'm just like you. Uh, as far as the X's and the O's and the mechanics on the field. But I'm going to take your philosophy and as it applies to how you handle people, make it completely different. And I have. And that's not a criticism. That's a learning experience. And I, I, I think that his rough love was what he knew. And it was plenty rough. But it's also what made him legendary and loved by all the players. This game wants to get you down, and it does. It gets everyone down. You are expecting yourself to do it all, and you can't. You really can't, ever. If you win, it's because of everyone. If you lose, it's because of everyone. It's never going to be just about you. And that puts you in the role that you really can perform in, and that is you, you're just going to you're going to do your best, and you're not going to let these added pressures uh, influence your performances or your attitude. I mean, it's, it's a tough game. When you get through everything else about Augie and you get back to the game of baseball, it is the fundamental game that drives his success. Keep your head and eyes level so that you don't lean over. If you start to lean over, then you'll start to come up. So that you're looking out front with both eyes and, you're, and the bill of your cap is parallel with the ground and it stays down. Now keep your head down. Everyone in baseball knows that good pitching will always offset good hitting. If you lose the fundamentals of your basic approach to run scoring and you start to put your emphasis on hitting, you'll start to try too hard to hit. And if you start to try to win games with home runs, you become much more vulnerable to striking out, popping up, grounding out, mishitting the ball. So you have to keep it simple and fundamentally sound. Two things that govern that, in my opinion, are bunning. Now you're sacrificing for the team and getting your job done. It controls a mentality of sharing. It controls a responsibility to contribute. And the other part is two-strike hitting. Cutting down your swing, making the adjustment, putting the ball in play, giving up your power. And, those, and between those two is where power remains consistent. Augie always preached you know, fundamental baseball. Go about the game the right way. Treat the game with respect. The game will respect you. By getting it down to one inning, you can start to get control of how it really works. You have three outs, both offensively and defensively. And then you start over. So I try to get our players to focus that way. What we're really learning about is how we take each pitch, capitalize on each pitch, to battle for the momentum during the framework of the inning and how each player on each pitch uh, needs to be competitive within their own routine from pitch to pitch. 
And uh, at the end of the inning, then we kind of take a look at it and say, here's where we are, and we try to keep our momentum based on, okay, we won that inning, we lost that inning. Even if there isn't a run involved, let's go get them. And baseball's a game of very subtle momentum shifts. A lot of times you don't even know what nuance created the difference in the game. One pitch here, one pitch there. I'm taking the winning the game at the end of nine innings out of the equation and saying there's going to be a winner over every pitch and there's going to be a loser over every pitch. Now it's about who is mentally the toughest. The classic one-on-one -on -one battle, of course, only exists between the pitcher and the hitter and from that point forward. So really what you have are these brief moments in time that belong to you and you need to recognize them. The routines that you need to develop are very much like the routines in figure skating or gymnastics or diving. And so trying to get players to get into routines in all things that they do. A hitting routine inside the batter's box. Back foot first, front foot first. Find your balance point in the lower half of your body. Left hand first, right hand first. Get your swing pattern. Make sure your wrists are snapping, not rolling. Know where your position of your bat is off your shoulder. Set your head and eyes so that your back eye is looking toward the pitcher and pick up a specific spot, the first letter on the pitcher's jersey. And breathe out and relax because you're finished with any of that kind of thinking. There's your routine for inside the batter's box as a hitter. Now, when the pitcher starts to get in rhythm, you get in rhythm. He's going to throw it, you're going to hit it. It's 60 feet, 6 inches to the plate. Don't be late. It's like running a race. If he throws it and you're just getting ready to start, you're too late. You've given him a head start, you're probably going to lose. So you get into rhythm. That's all you concern yourself with. And track the ball and then react instinctively. Don't try to force any swing. The question for everybody else is, why don't you want to get bigger than college? It's other people's egos that want him to go to the professional level. His ego is, he's figured it out, you know? And that's the whole, that's his whole point. His whole point is figure out what you want to do in life and then do it the best you can do it. From time to time, I'm asked the question, uh, do you want to go into professional baseball and managing? And my answer is no, I don't belong there because I have a teacher's mentality. And I know that because the only reason I think baseball is important is because we're using the game to help people discover things about themselves and how to develop the skills to overcome what appears to be a crisis or a failure. And that's what life is about. And so we're using a game to help people help themselves. Whereas in professional baseball, you're using the people for the betterment of the game. And I don't think the game's that important. He was not lured by going back and forth to uh, being a third base coach in Atlanta or a, a minor league coach back in Fresno or something. He was content to run a college baseball program and build it from the ground up and work with young men. It all just fit well for him. This was just what, what uh, he was put on earth for, and he recognized it early enough and just stuck with it and proved successful. My career was based on passion and the fact that I didn't want to work. I had a lot of bad jobs when I was a kid, picking fruit and cutting grass and delivering papers, and that was work. And I didn't want to work on the shipyard like my dad did. I didn't want to do that. I took something out of passion. I didn't ask, how much do I get paid? Is there any job security? What is it involved? I went for it because I loved it. But I found out later it wasn't the game that I loved. It was the people involved with the game and the relationships and the experiences. At 22 years old, I'd graduated from college. I'd been in and out of the Army. I'd signed a professional baseball contract with a six-figure bonus, which I thought was more money than anybody else had on the planet. I was aspiring to be a professional baseball player, but that wasn't my ultimate goal. I wanted to be a coach. Even though I played for five years in the Cleveland organization, it still was a training ground for my coaching career, and I knew that. At 26, I decided it was Time to get started and not continue to chase this major league dream, but to get into uh, the coaching world because I knew I had to serve my apprenticeship. And I started at Sierra Union High School. 
when I had a student that played for Augie at San Luis Obispo, and he told stories of Augie and this team painting benches, painting dugouts, doing the field, doing all of that kind of stuff with a good spirit. And of course, Augie was right in there doing it with the guys. Now this is pre-Augie. This isn't the Augie Gree that we know. This is when he was sanding benches and fixing up stuff, and then he got the job at Fullerton, and the, his life was changed. Fullerton was 12 and 44 the year before I took over, but they were right in the heartbeat of where baseball is in Southern California. Bedroom communities of over three million people, all of them playing baseball from the time they could pitch, throw, run, and hit and outdoor weather conducive to it being a year-round sport. So the recruiting became a reality and the player pool was there. Now how to get them into that program was a, a different challenge, but it starts there. You know, if you're going fishing, you want to go, I think you want to go where the fish are. We got the players, for the most part, that were overlooked by the big schools, Stanford, UCLA, USC at the time was a power. Arizona State, Arizona, all the schools would come into Orange County. They'd go through and take the top layer of players out after Major League Baseball. And then we'd kind of get the guy that wasn't quite so tall, wasn't quite so fast, and didn't throw quite so hard as a pitcher. But what you get in that person is a person that uh, has been that way for a long time and he's watched the tall, fast, handsome, rich kids um, have everything, and they've hated it. And they hate it because baseball's their passion, and these guys have everything they don't have. But what they get from it, unknowingly, is they get the spirit, and they get the, the, the fight, and they get the competitiveness, and these other guys don't. It was probably the lowest budget in Division I in the nation. It, it didn't matter, you know. It didn't matter. He, he found a bunch of guys that believed in themselves and believed in him. We had no facilities. The facilities were basically a physical education playground with no electricity, no locker rooms, no stands, just a chance to play ball. We had a chance to play ball. He came into my office and introduced himself. He said, you the equipment manager? I said, I am. He said, I'd like to look at our uniforms. I said, okay. Well, the previous coach we had had some gray felt uniforms. He looks at me and says, burn them. And I said, pardon me, coach? He said, burn them. I said, we don't have any other uniforms. He said, burn them. I said, okay. He said, we don't have a budget either. He said, burn them. I said, okay. So we packed them up in a bag and took them to the dumpster. And he uh, went down, told the athletic director, we don't have any uniforms. He said, yeah, we have some uniforms. No, we don't have any uniforms. We just burned those. So they came up with some money to buy us some new uniforms. And back then, Fullerton, I mean, we changed in the parking lot. No seats at all, except a couple of bleachers. And, and that was our locker room. We were not reflecting on what we didn't have. We were more focused, thanks to Coach Garrido, on what we did have, and that was an opportunity to excel at Division I baseball, maybe make our way to Omaha and play for a Division I championship. Pay wasn't that good. Field wasn't any good. Budget wasn't any good, yeah. What was good was that. It's the second trip in five years to the finals for Cal State Fullerton, by the way. As they come into their series ranked third of the nation, they The thing I remember the most about the 79 College World Series, actually the lowest point is what I remember. We lost the first game to Mississippi State. And all of us were disappointed, shocked, all the things that you are. And we got in the clubhouse afterwards, and he said, this is going exactly the way we want it to go. Everybody just kind of sits back, oh, what? No, this is going exactly the way we want it to go. From now on, every team we play will have lost, and we will have won. And we're always going to be playing somebody that feels just like you do now after losing this game. We got him right where we want him. There's a base hit in the right field. May score a run. You know, we went in and we had a chip on our shoulder. 
And um, and that came from Augie. It was a direct correlation to that. I mean, we had something to prove. We weren't pedigrees. We weren't the blue chippers. You go play the University of Southern California's, UCLA's, Arizona State's, and and we walked in with a little bit of attitude because, yeah, these guys are prima donnas, and we're going to show that they're prima donnas, and we're going to go in and take it to them. And I'll tell you what, out of the four years I was there, the majority of the time we did. Swung on, fly ball, a pad. Looks like it's going to get over the left fielder. It does. going to be off the wall. Brummel rounds third. He's on his way home. McReynolds is going to be... Here's the throw to the plate. Hoffman <laughs> the hitter. Here's the ground ball. Pass the third baseman. It's fair. The left fielder comes over and gets it. Here comes the runner on his way to third. The throw. Ash is out. I got the opportunity to pitch the, the Pepperdine game, the semifinal game. And uh, it didn't turn out the way I had wanted it to. And uh, I think I went two-thirds of an inning, gave up, I think, three runs. The last was a home run. Might have been four runs. And we came back, clawed our way back, and won the game. And I didn't even get out of the first inning. So I was down in the, in the clubhouse because I had thought I had blown the opportunity for us to win a national championship. Well, I hear the cheers, and we still come back. We start taking the lead. So I come up, and now I'm involved in the game again. And the game's over, and I'm fired up like everybody else because we're going to the final game. This is excellent. This is great. And I, I assumed one of the other pitchers was going to throw because I threw that day. And uh, I'll never forget it. Augie walked down to the end of the dugout and he says, get some sleep tonight. Why? And he says, because you're throwing. Said, Didn't you just watch what, you know, I couldn't believe it. Could not believe it. So I went back, didn't get a whole heck of a lot of sleep, and then came back. And as, as fate turned out, we ended up in a heck of a ball game, winning two to one. The rest is history. That was the pinnacle of my career. Since my memory is one of the great moments in, in all of sports that I've ever seen to see uh, the upstarts from Fullerton. Of course, I knew them because I covered them. And a kid pitching on zero days rest, uh, winning the national championship, but pitching on just guts and heart was just a, a wonderful moment. And the emotion, the electricity in the air was terrific. Probably the best moment that I have in baseball. I just, I, I can still remember that night uh, everybody jumping on each other because I never won a championship. Never got to a World Series. I was close, but never got there. So I'll always have that, and that's something that, you know, I can never take away. It was a remarkable team. It really changed the baseball program here forever. One of the things in coaching, I think, where I really do differ, and, and I'll admit to that, is I believe that the relationship between the coach and the student athlete should be as intimate as their personalities will allow. And therein lies the chance for the greatest growth to take place. His main objective for everybody that's associated with him is to be true to themselves and be who they are. And then we'll work within that framework and try to put that together as a team. Now, I think a lot of times that's where coaches make their mistakes, is that they want the team to be the same, so they have the same cookie-cutter approach to producing the same thing no matter who the people are. That isn't how we do it here. What we do is find out who the people are, what their instincts are, and respond to them, and react to them, and build a team around their personalities. Now, so that's very risky. That looks like a major league catcher right there. What if the players aren't very good and don't care very much? You lose but you're at least meeting the needs of the players and the team on, a, on, on the basis of what their needs are, not what you want them to do. What, what, what I want for them and what the other coaches want for them is for them to be successful and fulfill their own destiny. Well, they have to have their own goal for that. If we're the ones that have to drive that, then we're probably gonna lose. It'll only take you so far because who finally plays in the game? the player. Every guy plays his own part, no more, no less, but performs it to the best of his ability. No matter how boring it may seem, how simple it may seem, how mundane, how, how little, it isn't little. There isn't anything little in baseball. It all matters. Most of the things that cause people to lose, they don't even know what they are. Most of what you do in the outfield is thankless. You're going to be moving, and we're going to watch to be sure that you're moving on every play. 
It's a nine-man defensive effort, and each player has a rhythm and a responsibility with each pitch. To get a good jump is where it begins, in case the ball's hit. Let's give ourselves a chance today to see what it can really mean when we do it, pitch by pitch, inning by inning, and accept that concept, and really do it. Cal State Fullerton in game 12. The Titans were the first to strike when catcher Bob Caffrey walked in the second inning. I clearly remember the fall of 83 into the season of 84, our first team meeting with Augie. And he had this pamphlet made up. Rules, regulations, everything from grooming to curfew to dressing to Titan time, which was our time to prepare the field. And the first sentence in there was, our goal in 1984 is to win the national championship. First team meeting. No ifs and buts, just this is what we're striving for. What are you going to do to be part of that team, to have a starting position? And right away, you start thinking, is this guy nuts? We barely have any, we haven't even touched a field for the fall practice, he's telling us we're expected to win the national championship, but that's how a champion thinks. In 84, we went down to Texas and played them. And I think in their pitching staff for the University of Texas, I think six guys made it to the major league level as pitchers. They were good. They were really good. Pitcher Eddie Delzer settled down to strike out seven Longhorn batters and allowed no more hits through seven innings. With a shot down the left field line, Ice Matter, though, as the next Titan batter, sent a threat and gave over to the interview gap to score Capri. Texas cleanup hitter. Last out, Dennis Cook, left handed hitter. I'll never forget. I think it was 2 2, two, two balls, two strikes, fastball away, and he popped it up to our left fielder, John Fischel. When that ball left that bat, we knew it was going to be caught. It was the most exciting thing up to that point in our lives. In their final three World Series games, the Titans downed the number one and number two rated teams in the nation, plus the defending national champion. For Cal State Fullerton and Coach Augie Garrido, it was a championship well earned. We all came to understand what was important in baseball with Augie. And that made it just so much more of a bond. That team was just that much better than everybody else. Talent-wise, we didn't have as much talent as probably the other seven teams in that World Series. But we had the strongest bond of any team there. And that's what, I think that's what made us come home as a national champions. What it's meant to me, it's, it's that one moment in time that all of us came together, and we can all draw from. So when I see these guys, we have this instant connection. You know, that at that point in time, we were the best. No matter how many times he, he talked to a team, no matter how long his meetings go with the team, that you will never see one player look away, look uninterested. He has that ability to maintain their attention, to look in their eyes and see every single one of them staring at him. That's a remarkable thing. Joe. Pick it up, pick it up another notch, come on. Let's just get, let's get, get yourself go. focused on this thing and get yourself competitive. You need, you need to put yourself in a position where you're out there and you're pitching your game on your terms. You've been a, not only a good pitcher, you've been a great pitcher. You know what I mean? Now you're waiting to see what's going to happen to you and being defensive about it. That isn't you out there. Let's take, let's take the real you out there, okay? And get yourself ready. Everything can be blamed on something else in baseball. Pitcher doesn't win, the shortstop made two errors, it's his fault. Pitcher doesn't win, we only had one run, they got two. It's someone else's fault. The umpire's no good. The hardest thing to teach is responsibility and accountability. The demon is fear. The warrior is confidence. And they battle it out. 
and that's inside you. And if you have that confidence, you are and you will perform to the level that you think you can. It's as simple as that. The real accomplishment in all this is, did the players reach the highest potential possible during this period of time? Did they? And we've done our best. The confidence is fleeting for them because they have had all this success and it's one of the demons. It creates the fear, not the confidence. And fear is a stronger power than confidence. Confidence has to fight like mad to win the battle against fear. And uh, confidence is a lot more fragile. Uh, you know, it's like putting a 245-pound lineman against a 185 running back. Uh, confidence is faster, but not as strong. In the Little League manual, it says, baseball builds character. That is not true. It reveals character. It reveals your heart. It reveals your soul to anybody that knows how to evaluate it. And it's trying to reveal it to you. In the final end run, baseball is not very important. What's important about baseball is a game. to win a national championship. Sure, we all wanted to do that. I expected that of myself, you know, being there for two years, that 95 being my third year, I guess you could say I've already been groomed over the first couple of years to, hey, it's time to win, it's your turn. And a guy like Augie, who's been there, done that from the 70s to the 80s, you have no other choice but to buy in. You're not gonna buy in, it's just, you're leaving. So, it, it's not pressure, it's just, you know, that, those are the expectations of where he, where he is and where he's been, it's the expectations of just winning, winning that national championship. Throughout the course of the season, we had one three-game losing streak, and I, I remember it vividly because it happened in Wichita State. We lost two games. We went to the University of Nevada in Reno. We lost the first game there. And Augie got us together and basically turned it over to the team captain. And the team captain at the time was a guy named D.C. Olson. So I said, D.C., I've told these guys everything I know about what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and it's doing no good. We're still all uptight. You say something. Well, man, we just gotta play ball. This is stupid. Well, man, we just gotta play ball. This is stupid. So the famous DC Olson speech <laughs> that just went on like that, and they did it. And he said, we're better than these guys, this is stupid. And it was just, you know, that kind of stuff. And they didn't lose a game after that. They won 18 games in a row after that. So runners at first and second now with nobody out. That brings up Katze, and this guy is dangerous. First pitch and swing and a drive deep to right center field. Way back, Dawkins at the wall, watches it sail over the center field wall. A huge home run for Mark Katze. We were going down in the bus, final game of the College World Series to play for the championship. We're playing USC. And uh, Augie stands up and drops his pants, and he's got these elephant boxers on. We're titans, we're elephants, is our mask guy. And it just really broke the ice, it loosened everybody up. You know, I mean, our pregame speech was, don't change a thing, let's go out and play like we played all year, relax. You know, it's one more game. And that was the philosophy. And we ended up really enjoying a very memorable 57 and 9 season. Next up was the red hot bat of sophomore Mark Kotze. Here's the kick in the 1 0 pitch. Swinging a high, deep drive to right. Kotze has back to back home runs, a three run shot and a two run shot. Wow, what a home run for Mark Kotze. All the nation is watching Mark Kotze have the biggest day of his life and the biggest game of his life. But in the bottom of the seventh, the Titans blew the game wide open. This one's well hit. Right field, way back at the warning track, at the wall, and it's gone. Tony Martinez with a huge three-run home run for Cal State Fullerton.
The 95 team was voted by the College World Series after 60 years as the best team to play in the College World Series, uh, the, the people in Omaha. And uh, Mark Kotze was voted the most valuable player in the 60-year history of the College World Series. Two on and two out. And all of a sudden, things have gotten a little more interesting here at Rosenblatt. It's 11 to 5 in favor of Cal State Fullerton. Left hander cuts into the bell. 0 2 pitch. High fly ball to left. This ought to do it. Miranda under it reaches up. And Cal State Fullerton has won their third NCAA College World Series championship, 11 to 5. Now they had the taste of sweet victory. They were the toast of college baseball. They were the national champions. An athletic program like this is what it is today because a guy with charisma, a guy with wit, a guy with charm, a guy with unending uh, desire for success was here and was able to make an impact on a lot of people's lives. You're not going to lose by two runs. I'm telling you right now, this guy's not going to keep the score this way. But I want you to have fun with, with all that you have left of this game. And this is a chance for you to show your character and your courage. It's been rough. It's been rough on you. But if you turn this thing around, it's going to go a long way proving that you're a battler and that you're, you've got the right stuff to be a major league pitcher. It's a big opportunity for you. And he's really the first coach that I played with that didn't focus as much on the technique of the game, although he did. He focused a lot on the, the psychological, emotional, spiritual aspects of the game. He always told us to compete against the baseball, not the team, not the opponent. Because if you really think about it, that's what you're competing against. Doesn't matter who's throwing it. The ball is what you're competing against. You compete to catch it, you compete to throw it to the right base, you compete to hit it, and, and that's what it's about rather than who's on the other side. You know, he says all the time, once the pitcher lets go of the ball, he can't do anything about it. After that, it's just what you're going to do about it. No matter who is on the mound or the team you're playing, you're always playing the game of baseball. You're never playing an opponent. That philosophy, I had to buy into that, and I finally did. And when I did, it made all the difference in the world. You'd always tell me, you know, before I went in, not every time, most time, you know, it's a gunfight. You know, you, you either shoot or get shot. You've got to work with yourself to get competitive and go in there like it's 0-0 zero, zero and just come right at them the way you normally do. Now, that starts out here, OK? All right, get ready mentally. Baseball is a kind of game that you really can put pressure on yourself, because if you make an out, sometimes you got to wait three more innings to get back up to fix that and there, a lot of thinking can go, go on. One thing that he said to me was pressure is a choice. And, and that's something that I've carried with me the whole time. The whole idea behind that is that everything is a choice. You have to choose what you focus on. And, and that's the, his whole idea. If you, when you choose to focus in practice, when you choose to focus in the game, if you can focus on the right things, then, you, then the results will take care of themselves. And that's what he was saying, is that you focus on the process, you focus on the right things, you know, identifying balls from strikes. Uh, you know, the, I want to start this fastball three inches outside and have it come right back here, not, oh my gosh, I've got the guy on second base, there's 10,000 fans in the crowd. If he gets, what happens if, if, if? No, I, I'm going to make my pitch and let it happen. He's not saying be relaxed, but when, he, when you're making a joke in a pressured situation like that, it helps relax guys, you know? And that's, and that's huge because college players, pretty experienced, but you know, still young, it's hard to handle situations like that, playing in front of five, 10, 15,000 people or in Omaha, 25,000 people. And you know, you're the center of attention, the pressure's on you. You know, if you do this, you win. If you do this, you lose. And that's, it's tough to handle. And a lot of guys, you know, that's, the, that's what makes or breaks a lot of college players. And he does a great job of helping us get through that by relaxing us and trying to have us think the way he thinks. I really don't have one thing to say. I just thought that if they were going to do that, maybe I'd come out and I'd do that. But, uh, it, 
So really the things don't change. I don't want to try to tell you what to do or not to do. They do have first base open, but it's always about hitting a mistake. You can throw anything at any time, but you just keep your eye on the ball and do what you normally do. Steven, now, now it looks like I told him something important. You know, he has a calmness about him. Is he always calm? <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> By any means, he's not a yeller. And when he does raise his voice, you know that it matters. It's like, OK, because he doesn't do it a lot. All right. In 15 minutes, you guys will probably all be fine with this, OK? So I'll just sum it up this way, as fast as I can. That is the most humiliating game in the last 10 years I've been involved with. All of us as competitive people uh, get to different places uh, in our mind at different times. But I think I have a tendency to break out of my professional responsibility and role uh, when I feel that I'm failing. And, and then I sometimes, uh, hopefully not very often, but I think I become that little boy that's saying, it's not about me, it's your fault. <laughs> and that's not right. How can we get picked off at first base? How can you do that? The f is that about? What do you think you're with there? This isn't about some game. This is about our lives. Don't you get it? Don't you get it? You don't have a choice. When I tell you to take, you take. Don't tell me you don't see it. You look. You understand? I don't give a Like I said, 15 minutes from now, you don't give a you walk out of here. I got to live with this mother embarrassing game the rest of my life. I have totally failed, you guys. We got beat at every single part of this. Everything. Everything. Infield play, they, two out hitting, everything. Totally stupid. I'm sorry. I apologize. I have totally let you down. I just think that, you know, when, when he would, I mean, really let loose, which probably happened, I don't know, six times in four years. But, I mean, you felt like you let him down. Like, that, that's how it felt. I mean, that's bottom line. Just like if you let your best friend down or your you know, dad down. I mean, that's how it felt. Like, you, you genuinely felt like, you know, I've disappointed this person. And the players use that as a, as a motivational tool to, to turn it around. You know, it's like, we got to turn this around. And it wasn't so much we had to turn around for us personally. And to some degree, it wasn't even like we've turned this around for Texas baseball. It was like, we let Coach Greedo down. We got we to turn this around for Coach Greedo. I can call every single one of my teammates and, and, if, and if Coach Guido needed a favor from any of us, we'd be there like that. Because they understand that Coach Guido really is, he's in love with the game, and he's in love with the idea behind the game, which is your best effort and understanding it. And consequently, he does fall in love with the players that really get it, that really take it to heart. And you fall in love with him. You do. All right, we're going to have a short meeting, Danksy. We're gonna have a short meeting. Awesome! <laughs> Good coach makes every one of those guys, whether it's the first guy or the 25th guy, whichever guy it is, want to play as good as he can possibly play for him. Not for himself, but for him. We were playing Rice. We're on national TV. It's a one-run game. We got a runner on third. And we got an umpire behind the dish that, that is known for his theatrics and wanting to be involved and be, be exciting. When I, I can't kind of came set, 
And I mean, I barely paused. I've thrown the same way the whole time, and, and, and he, he called me for a bop. Bop called on Houston Street by the home plate umpire, Tim Henderson, and Rice has tied the game. And Augie Garrido is out to argue vehemently with home plate umpire Tim Henderson. This may be a matter of time. Augie Garrido thrown out of the game. About two minutes into it, I realized that he's not just defending the call, but he's defending me. He's defending me as a person. And he was defending the team. And I think that was one of those situations where everybody kind of realized his love for all of us at that moment because he knew that was wrong for him to call a balk. I remember feeling this sense of responsibility. It, it, hey, <laughs> Coach Guido just did his part, my time to do my part, give these guys a chance. And we did. We came back and we beat them. And it, it, it's, it's a Coach Guido moment. <laughs> I was on the athletic council when we hired Augie, and we asked Bill Little, the sports information director, who's the best baseball coach in America? And Bill Little said, uh, well, it doesn't matter. We can't get him. Well, and I said, well, Bill, uh, that may be true, but uh, who is it? And he said, it's Augie Garrido. And so I called Augie, and he said, well, what are you looking for? And I said, well, I'm looking for the best baseball coach in the country. And he mentioned several names, and so I just stopped him in mid-sentence at one point, and I said, well, is the best baseball coach in the country interested? The first things that popped into my mind were what an exciting opportunity and what a challenge. And uh, was I ready to take the risks to go from an environment where I was basically bulletproof to an environment where coaches usually fail. Because following a legend, and Cliff Gustafson is a bona fide legend in college baseball, is the riskiest thing to do. Hadn't worked well at Alabama since Bear Bryant, hasn't worked very well at UCLA since John Wooden in basketball, and it doesn't work very well in very many places. And therein came a little glow in my heart and a smile on my face. If it can't be done, let's see if we can do it. Secondly, all of the coaches at Fullerton needed to move up. They were ready. They'd all played for me at one point in time. They'd all gone out and coached at different places, and I brought them all back together at Fullerton as a coaching staff. It benefited everyone, and uh, I, quite frankly, just want to see if I could do it. The coaches who had been at Texas had all been premier coaches. There had only been three, really, who had coached baseball at Texas. One of them was a guy named Billy Dish who started the program and then Bib Falk, who was a former great major leaguer, and then Cliff Gustafson, who'd been there and been very successful and been a, a friend of Augie's for a long time. So to step into that environment was not necessarily an easy thing, uh, especially given that the talent pool was not nearly what it had been at one point. So when Augie came to Texas, he left a program at Cal Fullerton that was really full of great players because they just won the series a couple of years before with what might have been as good a team as there's ever been in college baseball. The question he had to face was, can I get it done at Texas based on the fact that this is a lot bigger building effort than I thought it was going to be? Because I don't think Augie realized when he came in that the situation here, the cupboard was pretty bare. The expectation level is the highest of any program in college baseball. The expectation is driven by passion, and passion creates love, and it creates hate. The UT alumni fan, me included, are irrational. They demand that you win, insist on it. Some form of radical, almost insanity. <laughs> we just have to do it. They want the players to do what it takes to win and there is not a lot of patience for the player development process to take place via losing. <laughs> so we know that. But there again, this is where I had to make a change. And I was reacting in a negative way when I would come in contact with the players because now I wanted the players to win the game so that it would take some of the heat off of me.
I think they even called him Soggy Burrito or something when he was losing early on. And I think people didn't understand where the program was when he came in. The first three years that I was here were complicated and difficult and challenging and frustrating. And it was rough. I'm sensitive, man. It, they hurt my feelings a lot. I think Augie put more pressure on himself than any fan ever put on Augie because he wanted to maintain the tradition or in the case of what he had to do, restore the tradition. And Augie was able to, through some really hard knocks, through some seasons that were tough for him, he was able to restore that so that by the 2000s, Texas was again the premier college baseball program in the country. Harold of Longhorns returned to Omaha for the 29th time. More trips than six of the 2002 College World Series teams combined. You know, you really can't write a better script than, you know, the 0-2 in Omaha. We had different heroes every game. Every game was close. You know, everything came together for that team, and it started with our attitude. And we had guys like Ryan Hubel and Jeff Onoveros and Chris Carmichael hits a three-run homer in the national championship game. It would just seem like everything we did went right. It was so special, it's still so vivid. It was never just one big goal, win the College World Series. If we take these small steps, we'll reach our final goal. I think that's one way that we were able to be consistent throughout the entire season. It was just the way that he prepared our team. First, he went deep to take away extra bases from Sam. I win the MVP of that series. Why did I win the MVP? Well, we had four save situations. I mean, if we'd blown them out 10 to 2, 10 to 2, 10 to 2, 10 to 2, you know, no one remembers me or that, even my performances in any of those games. But then you look at Justin Simmons. He pitched, he got two wins in the College World Series. I mean, uh, Onoveros hitting a home run to come back down the left field line. We, we had so many big performances. In the truest sense of the word, that was a team. You look at J.D. Reiniger hitting a three-run home run in the Stanford game. And I remember in the, in the World Series, there was a play when uh, it's 3-0, and I'm thinking, man, he's going to take. He's going to give me a take. And I look over there, and he's just not doing anything. Sure enough, I swung and actually hit a home run. It was against Stanford. You can't say goodnight to this one. Home run by Asky. Longhorns reclaim the lead, six to five. I was talking to him after the game. I said, Coach, did you know it was 3 0? He goes, Yeah. He goes, but he said, I figured you'd make the right decision. <laughs> Probably the defining play of the whole thing was Omar's, where we're playing Rice, and the ball hit off of Omar's glove from the hitter and kicked into foul territory. Breaking pitch, it down toward third, boot it! Gonna try to score, here comes the play at the plate, he is! Mercy. Out of the plate! That turned that whole season around, I think. Every time I watch it, it brings back the memories of my college years, of that great year we had when we won it all. Chris Carmichael looked to justify Augie Garrido's decision to insert him into the lineup. I remember when Chris came back his senior year, and the odds were definitely stacked against him. I mean, he'd had a rough junior year, and he worked his tail off every day. I mean, he was running to first base harder than Ian Bale. I mean, he's like he's a freshman trying to, you know, show what he was about. And I remember the first lineup Coach Greedo put up in the 2002 season, he called us all together, and he said, you know, um, this lineup today is not about the most talented players on this team. It's about the players that want it the most. And that's why Chris Carmichael's going to be in left field. And so Carmichael was the opening day starter in left field for us when physically, you know, he was not our best left fielder. Breaking ball, this ball hit pretty well. Down the right field line. He's got a chance. Get down of here. Three run over. Chris Carmichael, seven two. Chris Carmichael hadn't played in, I'd say, roughly 15 games. Coach Grito starts him in left field and hits a national championship game winning home run. And, you know, the rest is history. The first three games were one-run games, so they were kind of nail-biters. We were up 12-6. We, we knew in that ninth inning we had the game pretty much won. Uh, you know, we had Houston Street on the mound. 
And so it was kind of just the anticipation of let's get these outs and let's celebrate, you know. What we've worked so hard for, we're there. Two was very, very rewarding because I knew that it meant acceptance. The goal at the University of Texas is to win the national championship. Well, you can't do that. It's too far away. You can't even practice toward that. It's too far away. So you have to come back to more immediate goals. And immediate goals keep you in the moment. So that's why we break the game down from pitch to pitch. And finally, if you want to win the national championship, you have to win a baseball game. Sometimes when you set goals, they're way too low. And I don't want to take that chance. I think everyone deserves the right to reach their full potential. And I think perfection is what you strive for, because you're going to fail. But when you're striving for perfection, you learn things. Sometimes when you set goals and you get result oriented and you don't obtain those goals, you're a failure. And Agio always talked about setting obtainable goals, not goals that are you know, hitting 400 in college. It would be to take every at bat like it was your last at bat or go about playing the game today like it was your last game. Give everything you have, and if you fall short, it's okay, as long as you know that you left it on the field. Nick, give me a little five here. Let me know you're alive. He's the youngest 68-year-old I've ever been around. For him to be able to relate in four different decades and understanding that change is gonna happen, you know, the guy doesn't win the most games in the Division I baseball because you have the best players. Guys don't go to the Hall of Fame because their stuff works every night. They go to the Hall of Fame because when their stuff doesn't work, they still find a way to win. For two or more, this is grounded to Johnston. 2005 came around and we were in the, you know, the postseason in Omaha. We knew our only goal was it wasn't to win, it wasn't not to lose, it was to play baseball the best of our ability. And if we did that, then we could live with it. And we did that, and, you know, we can live with it. I didn't sign up to come to Omaha and finish eighth. You know, I signed up to come to Omaha and win this deal. And that's the expectations that are set here, not only by the fans and the university, but that's Coach Carrito. And, you know, as much as the fans mean and as much as the university means, you want to do it for him and for the other 24 guys in that locker room, you know? It's a combination of great talent, great physical ability, super performances. Um, you may never put together an infield as good as the one that played for Texas in 2005. Our fielding percentage was 978, which is the highest in University of Texas history. Hudson, nice play. Combine that with the lowest ERA in the history of the College World Series, and you have a national champion. We had so much postseason confidence that we knew we could beat other teams. We didn't care if they had a better team. We didn't care if they were at home, we were on the road. We had so much confidence and experience, and we knew going into these series that we had an edge over these teams. One for three, singles, first time up. Try to dump that in right center. Stubbs dives. The defense not only made the routine play, but they also were taking base hits away and converting them into outs on very difficult plays. It looked like Wheelis might have hurt his hand or wrist as he tried to apply. I think one of the defining moments in 05 was uh, Chance Wheelis' home run against Baylor. And without a doubt, one of the most uh, dramatic uh, moments of any College World Series uh, game experience that I've ever been involved with. He had dislocated his shoulder. And we really, at that point, didn't know how to deal with it from a medical standpoint. And it was coming out on him. And when it would come out, it would be when he'd swing and miss. So he had struggled through this game. 
with a lot of pain. And now it's the last inning and the score is tied and he's the leadoff hitter. And I went down and said, Chance, I'm going to pinch hit for you. And he said in his own way, Coach, uh, I can really hit this guy. I've hit him hard all my life. And I said, really? I said, well, what about your shoulder? He said, it's not going to matter. So I walked back, and my coaches kind of go, what are you doing? I says, look, all my life, I've been around players that coaches think are weak, aren't tough enough, aren't strong enough. Don't do it like the old days. This guy just told me he wants to do it. He's all of those things. I don't care whether he gets a hit or not. I want to see this. You know he's hurting because this guy's got some pretty good power. <laughs> Goes after that one and hits a bomb deep down the right field line. It's gone. Holy cow, Chance Wheelis with a bad shoulder hits a bomb in the right field stands to win it for Texas. Are you kidding? Pretty dramatic, pretty exciting. Huge miracle is just is the loudest and most direct and clearest statement about what people are capable of doing when they know they can. And then the next guy hits a pretty hard ground ball to Merol at third base. And before we knew it, they had, we had turned a double play, and it was like, holy, we're about to win this deal. Will it be Augie Garrido's fifth? national championship the last batter i just remember every pitch you know the crowd's clapping getting louder and louder every pitch i throw a strike they go crazy and start still clapping you know just constantly clapping and it was just i can still remember it like it was yesterday so then he throws in the back door slider striking out struck him out it's over and there was a little pause there like as soon as he did it you know i was like is this really over did we really just do this and then sure enough, I mean, I, I probably ran the fastest I've ever run to get to the mound. And then, I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. I can't, even, I can't even put it in the words. To win that final game like we did, um, you know, striking out the last better and JV being on the mound, you know, falling to his knees and everything, that's just, that's what our season was, you know? We did it. A lot of people didn't think we could. We started off slow, we ended on top, and that's all that matters and uh, we're going down in history because of it. The national championship team, it was about the best players on the team were the hardest workers and had the most fun. They found the fun in the game. They loved the game. They had fun off the field together. They had fun on the field together. There was the right attitude. It was a fabulous balance of uh, competitive genius and boyish fun. You can talk about all of the success that, that Rod Dato had, and certainly he was a great coach at Southern Cal. And look at the windows of success that LSU had and some of the others in streaks that existed. But when you look at the longevity that Augie has had, and yet he still presents the image of a very young guy. But he won a national championship in 1979, in 1984, in 1995, and then two in the 2000s. That is an amazing statistic. A lot of what I am is because of what I'm not. I don't have any hobbies. I don't care about a lot of things. I care about my relationships with my family. I care about my relationships with my friends. I care about my relationships with the people I know, my acquaintanceships. I care about that a lot. And most of the things I do are about that. Besides that, I care about the game. I think the biggest thing that I take from Coach Garrido is that baseball is a sport where a lot of what you get out of it is what you put into it. Well, everything in life is that way. There's an old saying that I try to use in my life that I want to learn as though I'm going to live forever and I want to live as though I'm going to die tomorrow. And I think that's a perfect analogy of Coach Garrido. I think I've questioned the boundaries, not the rules. That's different. 
the boundaries. Who sets the boundaries and says that you were born to pick cotton, boy? So my mom did. But the rules and the social order is set up that if you want to cross these socioeconomic boundaries, you're going to pay a price for that. You got to be willing to pay that price if you want to be who you're meant to be. Not who you want to be, who you're meant to be. I'm just pursuing who I'm meant to be because I think once you fulfill that, you have something to give back to others that matters. And I know I do. You do carry with you because sometimes it won't even be until a year later when you think back on something like, man, I was so right. Like when he used to tell us all the time, all the time, you don't realize how much fun you're having right now. You don't realize it. This will be the most fun you'll ever have playing baseball. The wins, the, the great successes you have here at the University of Texas will be the most rewarding experiences of your life. You know why? because you're doing it just to do it. I'm not saying I don't love playing pro baseball. I love playing pro baseball. I consider it a privilege and a blessing. But you want to talk about pure fun, playing for Coach Greedo, playing for the Longhorns. That's the purest form of just commitment and dedication that I've ever experienced. I just wanted to be a little child, skipping through life, having fun. And I still do, by the way. <laughs> And I am, too. <laughs>